The eyes of science and aviation are on the new cult of stratosphere ballooning. But just what is the stratosphere? Well, we'll tell you. The Earth is enveloped in a sea of air which we call atmosphere. The higher one goes, the colder it becomes. Viewing the Earth from this angle, we see the atmosphere divided into several well-defined layers. The innermost of these is called the troposphere. It's the air in which we live. Above the troposphere is the stratosphere, a much thinner mixture. The troposphere reaches to a height of six to ten miles. Mount Everest, the very top of our Earth world, rises five and a half miles above sea level, more than halfway to the stratosphere. Now, the troposphere is constantly in motion due to its proximity to the Earth's surface. But above, in the stratosphere, there are neither storms, winds, ice, rain or fog. Silence reigns eternally in the icy coldness of 70 degrees below zero. The sun and stars shine brightly in a purplish black sky. From the vast space between the stars far above the stratosphere come the cosmic rays, which are believed to be the key to the creation of matter. To study them, experimenters have fitted their laboratories into giant balloons. Endeavouring to get above the Earth's storms and disturbances, they rise into the void of perpetual calm and quiet in order to study what is over and beyond. The highest an aeroplane has ever flown is eight and a half miles. But in 1932, Professor Picard made the first scientific flight, achieving a height of 10.1 miles. In 1933, Settle and Ford near the United States Army rose to an altitude of 11 and a half miles, obtaining more valuable data. Soviet airmen then broke the record and attained a height of 11.8 miles. There is a limit to which free balloons can ascend, so perhaps the future of stratosphere exploration lies in the rocket type of ship, and there's no telling what wonders will be discovered. It has been proved that stratosphere flying is practical. Aeroplanes will be able to shake off the resistance of dense heavy airs as they rise higher into the stratosphere and reach 500 miles an hour. Commerce will then be able to speed from America to Europe overnight. Of two high Wickham scientists, they've designed a spaceship to take them 180,000 miles from home in one hop. High Wickham to the moon. Introducing Mr. Ross and Mr. Smith. Tomorrow, they may be the first men in the moon. Here's the design for the spaceship in which they'll make test flights. And here's the landing base they'll build on the moon if they get there. Pioneers Ross and Smith have spent 20 years studying the possibilities of interplanetary communication. They are certain it can be done, but there's one snag. The project will cost nearly half a million. trips to the moon may be an everyday thing, and here's what you'd wear. Man's dreams have taken flight into tomorrow. Three paraboloidal reflectors, dishes for short, one of them movable, the other two fixed, are a striking feature of the Science Research Council radio telescope at Cambridge. On invitation press day, explanation was made by Professor Martin Ryle, director of the observatory, a young man who increases our knowledge of the universe. This team of scientists, who have the mysteries of radio astronomy at their fingertips, command international respect, though few pretend to understand how they work. The telescope is receiving signals from deep space, from astral bodies infinitely more distant than so far recorded. Nowhere does the term astronomical distance mean so much as in this observatory where they've had signals from more than 8,000 million light years from the Earth. Illustrated by a photographic comparison, the Cambridge signals are represented by a clear picture, the blurred one representing reception by single-dish telescopes. For another side of research, take this aircraft, seven miles above the Pacific, and fit it out as a flying observatory. The telescopes used are optical, giving visible images. In this way, a recent solar eclipse was clearly observed. Merely by placing in line with the eyepiece a sheet of paper, all phases of the eclipse were seen and photographed. The moon is now almost hiding the sun. Optical astronomy is not superseded by radio observatories. In our present state of knowledge, both are necessary. The flying observatory brings into sharper focus man's picture of the heavens. 
London, the Imperial College of Science and Technology. Meeting place for space scientists from 50 nations. Specialists who have helped develop the equipment which has taken mankind into the new age of space exploration. From America, behind the Iron Curtain and the many countries where space research is carried out, they came to see one of the marvels of this modern age, the complete results of a lunar reconnaissance rocket. This is a reconstruction of an American moon probe in action. On this occasion, the mission was to make a soft landing and beam pictures back to Earth. But other moon craft have built up a complete picture map while in orbit, a view unequaled by the world's best telescopes. While the 1,000 members of the International Committee on Space Research were in England, this moon map was reconstructed for them to study. A chance to set foot on the moon for the first time. The scale of the map is 10 miles to the inch, the biggest close-up the scientists had ever had. But at this meeting, it was international rather than national achievement that mattered. There's no room for politics either. So with the recent launching of America's 50th Delta rocket, it was the world of science that triumphed. The vital information sent back from the moon by this shot will help prepare all mankind for the exciting times ahead. A million dollars is chicken feed of the European Space Technology Center at Nordwijk in Holland, where space research is undertaken on behalf of all the member countries. Scientists and technologists from Britain, the Netherlands, France and other West European nations, 600 in all, explore the problem of space flight and satellite communications. Their research equipment is among the best in the world. Space equipment is tested in a laboratory where the environments likely to be encountered can be accurately simulated. Through the work being carried out at Nordwijk, Europe will one day assume its place alongside the space pioneering nations.